without further delay, I'd like to hand over to our first keynote speaker, Jean Seaton. Jean is director of the Orwell Foundation, which she took over from Sir Bernard Crick, and which she's grown um, untiringly, it seems. And she's a professor of media history at the University of Westminster. Her volume of the official history of the BBC is called Pinkos and Traitors, the BBC and the Nation. She's written about many different things, including wars, conflict and the media. And her keynote talk today is titled George Orwell and Fear in 2022. So over to you, Jean. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. Um, I just wanted to start really with an apology. When Nathan asked me, I didn't know that at this precise moment, I would have uh, very large numbers of Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan and Bangladeshi journalists uh, in the UK for a, a unique foreign office programme I run because COVID had backed it up. So I can't come in person to other events, so I'll catch them up later. But I just wanted to really apologise for that. But COVID has, uh, uh, has changed timetables. Um, I just say, and thank you very much for asking me. Um, I wanted to start actually with a sort of a slightly sideways thought, which is that I've spent a lot of my writing life and thinking life, as it were, um, thinking about and writing about and spending time with journalists and many of them um, have a very particular set of challenges which is that journalists are expert at calibrating um, a, a terrible set of sort of paradoxes uh, how 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 much do they have to shock you to grab your attention to make something that is really important uh, become salient and to what extent, and, and how do you, in a bigger, bigger, bigger challenge, a bigger sort of scheme of things, as it were, assign legitimate awfulness and responsibility to different orders of terrible things? So journalists are very interesting because in a way, they are very adept, good journalists, at pitch, not frightening you too much, but frightening you enough, catching your attention. Journalism is all about attention. Um, and a lot of journalism, a lot of, I've written quite a lot about this really, is, you know, if they shock you too much, is that making you, does that uh, uh, um, um, emaciate proper responses? If they don't shock you enough, do you not take it seriously enough? And anyway, public attention is very, um, fickle, you know, it, it, and it's very difficult to get attention for, for things. So it seemed to me that I hadn't really thought of this before I came to think about this, that um, calibrating fears is one of the things I've often thought about. And it raises the problem of what fears we should take seriously. Since, as it were, Nathan asked me to do this, and I'm absolutely you know, um, to do this. It seems to me we have, in a way, in short order, taken on, um, in a way we hadn't expected. Nathan's first quote was really tremendous because it, actually the 19, the post-war settlement we've all lived in was far more stable than the post-war settlement Orwell lived in. Between the First World War and the Second World War, if you look at any politician's papers, they were like rabbits and headlights. They knew another war was coming. We have lived in a world order which has relatively, and of course there have been many atrocities and so forth, but relatively kept some kind of stability. Um, and that's, all of those world order things may, may be breaking down. So the first sort of existential challenge obviously is climate change. Um, and that's for journalists. And we know that Orwell would have taken that seriously because when asked to think about something terrible, he goes and looks at a flower. You know, the, 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 he's very in tune, as it were, to that. So the existential, the biggest existential challenge, without a doubt, that we all face is climate change. And there's some very interesting arguments going on about 
if you look at um, Joshua Oppenheimer, the filmmaker, how you how you tell the story of something catastrophic in a way that isn't catastrophic, or look at um, some of the really interesting things on the politics of cops. So that people are grappling with how to frighten you enough, but not so much that you just turn off. Then there's the what I can only call the, the Trump storming the Capitol, but it's much bigger than that. It's the rise of populism, which is in itself in a Orwell kind of way, clearly related to a change in the information which populations live within. The BBC was set up in 1922 in order that people could individually make up their minds, as John Reese said, about important things that were of matter, public matter. And we now, I think, are in, are we in? Uh, we're certainly in a period where we cannot be secure that how people understand the world is in their own interest anymore. And that's a, that's a very interesting new development. Then there was COVID. It seems to me COVID um, was a very personal fear, or at least that, that's how it was experienced. It was obviously a collective fear, and how our countries managed it was also a collective issue. I suggest you all look at Cameron Abassi, the, uh, the deputy editor of the uh, British Medical Journal, in which he does, he's got a very good chart and he shows you excess mortality. And of course, lots of countries don't tell us, we don't have accurate figures for Indian or Pakistani excess mortality. We do have accurate figures for ours and we do have accurate figures for Americas, but, um, excess mortality com uh, uh, completely tells you if you're in a populist or quasi-populist country. This is not comforting news for the UK. Um, so just that f figure. So COVID, I think one felt personally, I certainly thought that I knew I had to die, but I didn't want to have to die in a tent with nobody to hold my hand. And that was a kind of completely new prospect of death, actually. And that's a really interesting thing. And now we have, and this is obviously a different, the, the, the war in Ukraine, um, how that's perceived all over the world, um, you know, all over South Asia, I have to tell you, Russians are seen as being legitimate for a whole series of reasons. So we live in our own little bubble here. Um, uh, so that's quite interesting. And that's obviously a destabilizing of the world order. So I think that since Nathan asked me, my kind of visual image is actually that somewhere about 2016, I thought I, I took Orwell on more personally. It was as if it, it had been a story, a prophylactic story about terrible things that had happened that I didn't really think were gonna happen again, but might warn me. And it, it's as if like, there's a British children's game called Grandmother's Footsteps, where the child at the end um, uh, turns its head round and the children try and creep up on it. And I think we've all been in a collective Grandmother's Footsteps. I hope that isn't too bizarre uh, for, for your foreign guests, but it's the children behind creep up. And the issue is to try and get to the child at the front. And we've been playing Grandmother's Footsteps. That's what I think we've been doing. Um, and that's what it, it feels, you know, very unstable now. Uh, all of which is a long introduction to Orwell and fear, but I think Orwell is one of the great maestros of fear. And I just want to unpack what belongs to him, what is collective and what's unique about him. And um, I come, you know, the, the, and, and, and I have abandoned my bit on Orwell and anger which would have given you another Orwell, um, a, a frankly, terribly unacceptable Orwell in some ways, saying wonderfully pungent things, many of which, you know, you, you would want to condemn him for now. But Orwell and anger is a very interesting separate, and he's certainly a man who understands anger. He sublimates it, but he understands it. So these are all obvious places. Um, and he's got wonderful bully worship. Aren't we in an era of bully worship, I want to say? You know, uh, um, uh, uh, 
at the moment, at this moment when Hitler has knocked cricket off the front pages, you know, how are we in that kind of moment? Um, uh, the popular front is an unholy alliance between the robber and the robbed, you know, just try and find the places to put that. But of course, the, the kind of existential fears that he summons up, I think so vividly, um, he puts, uh, uh, he puts into, to some extent in 1984, but also in the essays. Being in a minority, even a minority of one, did not make you mad. There was truth and there was untruth, and you clung to the truth, even against the whole, and if you clung to the truth, even against the whole world, you were not mad. Now, of course, the truth is a very, not a simple thing, but I can think of any number of arguments going on in pages today that, that relate to what is the truth. This is from um, 1984. All the others, even those who resembled ourselves, says O'Brien, were cowards and hypocrites. The German Nazis and the Russian communists came very close to us in their methods, but they never had the courage to recognize their own motives. They pretended, perhaps they even believed, that they had seized power unwillingly and for a limited time and just around the corner, the lay of paradise where human beings will be free and equal. We are not like that. We know that no one ever seizes power with the intention of relinquishing it. Power is not a means, it is an end. One does not establish a dictatorship in order to safeguard anything. One makes the revolution in order to establish a dictatorship. The object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. The object of power is power. Now you begin to understand me. I'm, Orwell was a maestro of his. He wrote about many kinds of individual and collective terrors. It was partly that he lived through terrible times that ominously gathered and bloomed over many years. Creeping dread was just where a sentient alert person on the left might dwell then. He put himself quite consciously in danger. He lived a precarious life and it never seemed to bother him. Indeed, he chose it in many ways. He, pref he preferred a kind of precarity. He liked his cup of tea and his roast beef, but other everything else was precarious in a way that I think is quite, it was thrust on him, but it was quite, it's quite interesting. He cared about money, but he cared about it in a small way. Um, he was dogged by ill health. Uh, homage to Catalonia, Animal Farm, The Lion and the Unicorn, most of the essays, but little of the diary. In all of these, Orwell is fearful in public and unsentimental and unanguished in private. Um, I'm going to say that, I think I've cut, but I mean, unlike quite a lot of co contemporary writers in which, as it were, much contemporary fiction starts with a private pain and goes out. It, 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 there's, there's no private pain that he, he puts in. Um, dread is his clay. Um, I did one of those sort of weird things you can do with your Kindle and looked up the, um, which you would have previously required an AHRC grant to do, and looked up fear, fear. And the really interesting word that popped up in, in the collected all well, across both the novels and thing, was not fear, but fearful. And he uses it in a, in a really interesting way, which of course de, de demonizes it. So fearful is an exaggerator, as in it was a fearful mess. People are fearful of things, but it seems to me that he uses it in a really interesting way, oddly to take the sting out of fear. I mean, that was, but there's an awful lot, there, there are rather more fearfuls than there are fears, which is rather interesting. Um, so if he's not fearful in public and unsentimental and un unanguished in private, um, nevertheless, some of the fears that one sees as uniquely or well are clearly shared. He's, he's picking them up. And, and if he's not picking them up, they're also shared by other writers who he didn't know about. And that, that, that takes some of the, I think that's important. Um, and indeed, in order to um, uh, identify, I think, Orwell's own contribution, um, the aspect of fears that he makes his own, it's perhaps important, perhaps the art he adds to fears, to see how far 
you know, the distinct temperament and characterization of fear that he has is, is, as it were, based on some common understandings of the period. So we're trying to take the world down a peg. I mean, I, I think he almost never starts with himself. He both simultaneously only starts with himself, and you might like to come back with that, and never starts with himself. Those are the two, that's the paradox in him. Many of the fears that he um, expresses are articulated or experienced by other writers he knew. It's very interesting, for instance, that one of his key sources during the 30s was, this, was in fact the Daily Telegraph in Britain. Daily Telegraph reporters on Nazi Germany included a young man called Hugh Cotton Green, later the Director General of the BBC, who, uh, who had his stories and his, his leader writers stories always put on the fourth page. And so it's very interesting that Orwell is reading Berlin through the eyes of what, who I think is the best set of reporters in Berlin. It's really interesting. And this is the Telegraph, not, not the Telegraph today, I have to say. Um, but obviously he knew Arthur Kersler, the novelist and writer, an ex-communist imprisoned in Russia, Spain and France and England within a year. That must be a sort of a, uh, 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 Guinness Book of Records thing. Tiber Feivel, the commentator he knew and clearly in some way got more, much from. From these people he knew about talk, torture, darkness at noon. But there are other writers who he doesn't know of who use some of the same tropes. And the one I want to, want to talk about a bit is Vasily Grossman, the Russian journalist and novelist who reported as an eyewitness from um, managed to survive, walked an incredibly narrow line with Stalinism. Um, and I want to come back to that. And, and clearly also Hannah Arendt, uh, a, a writer who knew him, but he didn't know, you know, so there are these, but who writes some of these same things. And I also just wanted to chuck in a woman called Elizabeth Fenn, who was a friend of Orwell's, who was a white Russian, who was uh, a refugee here, became a child analyst. And there, there are some quite interesting discussions with her. So, you know, we can see where he is. These people are saying some of these things. All of these writers, Orwell, Kessel and Grossman and Arendt, were basically on the left. Kessler was a member of the CP. Grossman had no alternative. And they had distinct personal relationships to what was happening in the case of Grossman and Kersler, and indeed the previous idealistic membership inside a domestication of belonging to the Communist Party. And they all describe the twists and turns of logic and the startling double think that being inside required. They're all sincere, authentic ex-communists. What's really interesting is that it is often said that, anti, that 1984 is anti-communist, but it's more complicated than that for all of them. And I was driven to inquire why there are no sincere and authentic memoirs leaving about leaving and unpicking Nazi ideology. So that, that, that communism, you can be in and come out, or you can be in and stay in. Uh, Nazis, you don't, you don't, so what goes on when you stop being a Nazi? Or what's that? Because one would have thought that was also interesting. And it's also interesting for now. Nazi ideology, fascism, say writers like Staggart, was a porous set of ideas with very strong continuities across two other ways of thinking. Romantic, nationalist, Christian, anti-religious, life reform, and so on. And so the rationales and descriptions of external reality are almost less, nearly always less abstract in, in fascism than they are in communism. And, the, of it, and the, the logic in fascism often works in didactic polarizing or Manichaean form rather than that of the closed system of communism. So when you do have crises of, of consciousness in Nazi ideologues, um, they, they always take the form of a kind of moral relativism. Militia Mashman um, is one famous, as it were, reformed Nazi afterwards who regrets, but 
her description of what she's doing is she's, she was a Nazi because it was a lesser or a greater evil. Martin Brozat's famous notion of resistance, the state of moral and political alienation from Nazism, which found its expression not in any outward show of resistance, but in a degree of non-conformer, conformity and inner withdrawal from the regime, um, deployed his, he deploys that idea, I'm not criticizing this, to um, separate the values of German society from those of Nazi regimes. So he's still hanging on to something. He's still hanging on to something. Um, so inner, inner immigration, a German idea, of course, is a very interesting idea now, and one frankly thinks of what must be happening to remaining uh, Russian intelligentsia or Ukrainian intelligentsia. But it's argued that the more piecemeal character, piecemeal character of German thought also meant it was much easier to change one's view. And what I want to make a connection with, it, which I think Orwell's very good on, is that Nazism led to what I can describe as a kind of whataboutery. We live in an age, it seems to me, of whataboutery. And Orwell is absolutely clear about the damages of whataboutery. If you want to have a discussion about the Ukraine, then people clearly raise the American intervention in Iraq. What about? If you want to have a discussion about what's happening in uh, 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 all over the Middle East, people will obviously say, what about Israel? What about a re is um, a very slippery, very useful, because these are all real problems. They're all real questions. What about a re raises real questions, but it has the effect I would argue, but this is a bit provocative, of doing the same thing as a kind of a fascist ideology, of saying everything is morally relative and that you can only ever look at one moral problem in, in, by putting it in a, in a set of scale, scales. What about her, it seems to me, is now the absolute privilege of the left. I mean, I could go into any number of things, but the, what about her has become a, a left-wing phenomenon um, and it was perhaps a light right wing phenomenon. So Orwell's uh, response to what about you in his own period was to say that an evil is a thing that is happening in front of you. And although there is lots of explanations and lots of, lots of caveats and lots of condemnations, and that's why he's so useful because he, he really was an anti-imperialist and he really was a pacifist. <laughs> but what about a re just stops you seeing what's happening in front of your eyes. And, and I just think that that, the, the, that kind of moral relativism, which we all encounter, I think, at the moment. So very quickly, I now want to go through some of the fears and where they were shared from and try and take them out into the world he lived from. So there's physical fear, torture, pain, psychological de degradations. Um, Orwell, like Kessler and Grossman, but not like a rent, fought. He knew killing from both sides. This is kind of an extraordinary experience. He isn't, I mean, he had shot animals. Uh, and one, may, one could then have a sort of interesting discussion about that. And there is, there is certainly a discussion to be had about Orwell and violence in general, but, that, but he did know it from both sides. He was shot at and he shot at people. Um, he, he, was a very, he was both an ill child and an ill man. And from the age of 32, extremely familiar, but never talks about hemorrhages the extraordinary outflowing of blood. And if you go through other TB memoirs, I think there's much more about blood and the very particular color of blood. And, but so he's, he's very, there's something about, like Keats, he must have known hemorrhaging, what hemorrhaging met, meant, but he doesn't, he doesn't really, and even though it's blood and that's related to killing, he never makes that connection at all. Um, if you want to keep a secret, you must hide it from yourself. Uh, do we find Orwell 
keeping a secret from himself. I think that's an interesting thing. But torture in 1984 is physical and mental. And although Purcell and sort of not Grossman can talk about it, sort of, though Grossman knows about it, torture was very much in the air in the 1940s. And bringing to bear my BBC knowledge, torture was played down, um, I can tell you, um, during the 1940s, and it was far more prominent in the 1950s. That's another paper. Torture was far more prominent in the early 50s than, for instance, Holocaust. So what you condemn the Nazis for was torture, and you condemned the Japanese because they did worse torture. It, it, it's, it's a very sort of complicated issue. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not unrelated to differences in German and uh, British in, uh, and allies. German and Japanese war experience, which the POW experience, which is very different. Being ill, when O'Brien shows Winston himself in the mirror, is clearly all well. The cough, the cough, we know about that. But oddly, despite all of that, intellectual fears, I think, are far more important for him. Precariousness, instability, vertigous, vertigous, vertigousness. Uh, the sacred principles of Insop, Newspeak, Doublethink, and the mutability of the past. He felt as if he were wandering in the forests of the sea bottom, lost in a monstrous world where he felt himself to be a monster. Uh, this is Vasily Grossman. So these men understand vertiginous. State terror, this is Vasily Grossman, was directed not against those who had committed crimes, this is so all well, but against those who, according to the security organs, were likely to commit crimes. So it's a very, th 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 there's a lot of all well that comes from being alive to the world around him. Fear of double thing. All well was in love with double thing. He circles round it. He is fascinated and entranced by double thing because he knows it very well, I think. He identifies it and knows it. Double think means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. Again, Grossman, in a long passage on, at the start of Stalingrad, um, has, a, has a wonderful passage in which one sister tells her artist and modernist sister to paint political posters and complains that she will go on about truth and art. There are true, two truths, says this sister. There's the truth of reality forced on us by the accursed past and the truth of reality that will help us defeat the past. Close your eyes and see the world around you, asks the sister. The mother, the really extraordinary older mother in the Grossman thing says, you're wrong. I can tell you as a surgeon, there is one truth, not two. When I cut somebody's leg off, I don't know two truths. In a war when things are as bad as they are today, there's only one truth. It's a bitter truth, but it's a truth that can save us. So again, that seems to me, that, you know, these people are grappling with the same problems. But the next big fear that I think he's absolutely in love with um, is complicity. And certainly, I, if you ask me, what was my biggest fear in life in a way? It is complicity. I think, I think complicity is a very, because it's so seductive. Um, what you might say is that he's also very good at, as it were, known complicity, when you know you're being complicit, and unknown complicity when you don't. And it's the second one he's frightened of. It's the unknowing complicity. Again, uh, this is Julia. Julia in, uh, uh, um, in 1984, they, make, they can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside you, but of course they can. Third fear he's right off is mob thinking. Um, I'm sorry, I must hurry up. Um, again, Orwell has, has a, this is really odd thought and I've just had it and I apologize it but I just over the weekend went to the Matthew Passion and in the Matthew Passion there are choruses which are as it were the bad public 
the mob public that demands Christ be killed, he's a sinner, he's accused. You're always in the, in the choruses, you're always in the company, because you are in the Matthew Passion, you're in the company of a bad mob. And in the chorales, you're in the company of your best selves. And they're very beautiful and they are very compassionate. And I think Orwell has those two, two kinds of groups because he both thinks that mobs are really dangerous, but he also understands that some collective good is a good thing. And I think there's a sort of, um, we all know about the two minutes hate, um, uh, but what is most insightful, we understand that Orwell and Arendt had both read Canetti and Burnham. We don't know what Grossman had read. Um, Grossman says one surprising things about camp inmates in Russia, sentenced for, for, felt that they were sentenced for a genuine reason for active opposition to the Soviet state, believed that all the political prisoners, prisoners um, were innocent, but people who'd been arrested like them um, believed that they should be pardoned. So it's a very double think and complicity are what these people are endlessly unpacking. Uh, a rent. Mass propaganda discovered that the world. Mass propaganda discovered that the world was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd. Did not particularly object to being deceived because because it held every statement to be a lie. Anyhow, that that's the that gets us to me to now I think, but it also gets us to what about should be. Um, okay, so he's quite contradictory. He's got that Matthew Passion contradictory about, about masses. Finally, tyranny of feelings. Uh, Orwell, as we know, is 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 has a complicated relationship to feelings. Um, as the Second World War emerges, he says he says the first air raid. There's no panic. He's talking about the British post. There's no panic. On the other hand, there is no enthusiasm. Uh, indeed, there's not much interest. So his description of the British public under this first attack is one of um, bored bewilderment, okay? Not, not feared terror. It's very, very interesting. Is that, is that a choice? Is that true? You know, it's very interesting. So he's, I think, um, concerned with the to, with, with the way in which feelings, as we can see, can overwhelm one, that feels very, and he's quite frightened of them. His own fears, in, so I think he's, he's concerned with, as many British writers going back to John Stuart Bill and even Milton at one point, are concerned with the tyranny of feelings, but holding true to real feelings. I mean, um, one of the bits that I always go back to in 1984 because it's just so brilliant. This so there's the tyranny of imposed feelings, and Winston, thinking about his mother's death, said said that um, his mother's death had been tragic and sorrowful in a way that was no longer possible. Um, today, there were fear and hatred and po pain, but no dignity of emotion, no deep or complex sorrows. So that sense of feeling, sort of private, because tragedy he perceived belonged to a time when everybody still had privacy and friendship and love. So, so real feelings are these, these rather private things and public feelings are nearly always dangerous, I think, really, he thinks. Finally, his real fear in a way is about, I think, um, the real fear in Orwell is about losing the capacity to comprehend reality. We know that, that what went into 1984, we know that what went into the homage to Café de Cal Catalonia, that everyday propaganda about the war in Spain, the sort of untruths that he saw. But his worry is, is really about his own capacity to go on apprehending reality. He's really worried about himself. Um, Nazi theory specifically denies that there is such a thing as truth exists, as frankly to most undergraduates rather casually at the moment. 
Um, and for instance, there is no instant, there is no uh, instance of such things as science. There is only German science or Jew Jewish science. So again, you see him going for a kind of relativism, I think really interestingly around reality. Um, final, final fear, grief. Grief is again unspoken in a funny kind of way in the world, but we know that he wrote 1984, um, mad with grief. He was mad with grief. He'd lost Eileen. Um, it was a complicated marriage, blah, blah, blah. He was bringing up Richard, great, great, great source of security and love and every day, you know, stamping on the cauliflowers, eating all the peas, a little boy around, making him completely hopeless toys. Um, you know, giving him, him baths in rooms which were perishingly cold. It very much anchored into a kind of normalcy. I think The Crystal Spirit, the film by Alan Platter, was scripted by Alan Plato, who knew Orwell, which is about Orwell and Barnhill. It's one of the most beautiful films about, which absolutely captures terribly sweet character, actually. But he was, he's mad with grief. Grief is not nice, sad stuff. It's urgent, it destroys a sense of history, and he's quite clear about that. You don't start off having a loss and get better. You are always thrown back. Any of the, uh, uh, there's another whole big on grief, but any of the people that write about grief point out that it's not, there's no weak theory of grief. You don't start down there and get better. It plays with time, it mucks with your mind, it, it throws you back. And that, when you look at his view of history, I think is very interesting in 1984, because he lives in a very complex personal historical being, as it were, always being thrown back is my, my suspicion, but I've got no evidence for that. So then we get to the paradox. Why does one read Orwell? One way that fiction uses fear is the unspoken fear of the reader. The reader knows more than the character. And I'm sure you're, I'm not a literary scholar. I'm a pathetic historian, really. So this is way out of my, my you know, territory. Um, but uh, I'm, so I'm, there must be a literary name for this. But you fear for the characters. And you read about them with a driving worry about what will happen to them. In this way, anxiety is a delicious property of reading and thinking. But it depends on suspense and is also perhaps a kind of dread. Mostly in Orwell, I really challenge you to care a hoot, care one bit about any of the characters. None of them are real. We don't care about their fates. Even Winston, even though we know he's Orwell, we don't really care about him. We, uh, some of them quite often positively nasty. I mean, a lot of them are positively nasty through from Burmese days, a book I think very derived from other books, but that's another thing. So we don't have sympathy for them and we don't really care for them. So what's going on? Animal Farm, there are characters you care for and they are wonderfully readable across to Grossman because they share Soviet, you know, the cart horse is both Soviet box, the cart horse is a great character out of Soviet mythology, also out of Lowe's cartoons, which is also out of Soviet mythology. You know, we know that all our new cart horses, strength, good warmth, you know, we care. So look at Vavilov in Stalingrad, the pony with her ribbons, the chickens. We care about those characters. They're the nearest we come to caring about. We certainly don't care about most of them. In 1984, we feel the seductive power of O'Brien, but we don't really worry or care for them. They're not those kind of characters. In any case, we know the ending. You kind of, this is not gonna turn out happy. Um, although in a funny kind of way, I think it, you know, I alone like the document at the end, <laughs> but that's, that's the historian in me. I, I, I love the document at the end. But this is Orwell's final great literary conceit. And it may be why the book's dreads hang around one like a miasma. And I go back to the, what I said at the beginning, we, these fears like grandmother's footsteps have get, been getting closer to us, I think. The fear is turned inward on the reader in a very unusual way. 
You don't worry about the characters. The suspense is not about whether they will triumph, they won't. Rather, you fear for yourself and your society. You measure, you assess, you grade, you see where we are and where they were then and how far, how long the road is. You calibrate in any number of ways where we or somewhere else is on that road. And I think his great literary achievement in a way is to turn dread, is to, uh, to make dread very personal. So he makes dread very personal for us, fear very personal for us um, and for our societies. And I think that's, that's, that's the fear he's mobilizing most. There we go. I'm sorry I've gone on. <laughs>